Monkeys are everywhere, right? Swinging through the jungles of South America, raiding tourist snacks in Asia, hanging out in African forests. But here's the weirdest part. Head north into the United States or Canada and you won't find a single wild native monkey. Not one. If you start in the southern United States and head south, you'll eventually reach the very top of the monkey world. And it's not far. Southern Mexico is the northern limit for wild monkeys today, and three species call it home. Howler monkeys, spider monkeys, and white-faced capuchins. Howler monkeys are the loud mouths of the jungle. Their roars aren't just loud, they're the kind of sound that makes you freeze and look around for whatever massive predator is making it. Except it's coming from a fluffy 8 to 10 kilogram primate just guarding its patch of the forest. Those calls can travel several kilometers, letting entire troops keep in touch through the dense canopy. Spider monkeys are the daredevils, built like living slingshots with impossibly long limbs and a prehensile tail that works like a fifth hand. They're fast, agile, and can launch themselves from branch to branch with a confidence that would put a parkour athlete to shame. And then there are the white-faced capuchins, small, clever, and bold enough to steal anything that looks remotely edible. They've been caught on camera using sticks to dig for insects, washing food before eating it, and even opening latches to get into containers. If a monkey could qualify for petty theft charges, it would be a capuchin. These species live in warm, tropical rainforests packed with fruit, leaves, insects, and flowers, food sources available year-round. Temperatures stay comfortably high, rain is frequent, and there's no season when life in the trees slows down. What's most interesting is just how close they are to the US border. In some areas, they live less than 1,500 kilometers away. In wildlife terms, that's practically next door. Plenty of other animals, jaguars, pumas, even smaller species like armadillos, have managed to expand their range much farther than that. So why haven't monkeys done the same? They're mobile, intelligent, adaptable, and yet their northern limit has been the same for thousands of years. It's almost as if there's an invisible barrier holding them back. And it turns out, there is. To understand why monkeys never made it into North America, we have to zoom way out. Not just on a map, but through time. For most of their evolutionary history, monkeys lived on a completely different island continent, South America. And for tens of millions of years, that continent was as isolated as Australia is today. No bridges, no causeways, just thousands of kilometers of open ocean in every direction. The ancestors of New World monkeys, the ones we see in Central and South America today, are believed to have arrived from Africa around 35 million years ago, most likely by accident. Back then, Africa was closer to South America than it is now, and chunks of vegetation big enough to carry small animals could drift across the Atlantic. It sounds crazy, but we've seen similar rafting events happen in modern times. Once those early primates landed in South America, they evolved into the dozens of monkey species we know today. The key thing is this. For almost all of that time, South America had no land connection to North America. The gap between them, the Central American Seaway, was a deep stretch of ocean. Animals could swim or fly across if they were capable, but for forest-dwelling monkeys, it was an impossible trip. That all changed about three million years ago, when tectonic activity pushed land up between the two continents, forming the Isthmus of Panama. Suddenly, there was a bridge. This event triggered what scientists call the Great American Biotic Interchange, a mass migration in both directions. Armadillos, opossums, and porcupines moved north. Horses, bears, and cats moved south. But there was a catch. By the time this land bridge formed, monkeys were already limited to the warm tropical forests far to the south. To reach what is now the US, they would have had to move thousands of kilometers through new and unfamiliar territory, passing through environments that weren't quite as friendly as their home jungles. For now, what matters is that monkeys simply got a late start. When the continents finally connected, they had a narrow window to move north, and other animals were faster to take advantage of the opportunity. Even if monkeys had tried to push north after the land bridge formed, they would have hit a wall that had nothing to do with geography, the climate. Monkeys, especially New World monkeys, are built for life in the tropics. Their bodies aren't designed to handle frost, snow, or even long stretches of cool weather. They don't grow thick winter coats, 
They don't store large fat reserves like some mammals do, and they rely heavily on a year-round buffet of fruits, leaves, and insects. That's perfect in the lush rainforests of Central and South America, but once you head north, those resources get seasonal. In temperate forests, winter strips the trees bare. Many fruits vanish for months, insect activity drops, and even the leaves they might eat are gone. Sure, some animals cope by hibernating or caching food, but monkeys don't hibernate, and their diet isn't suited for long-term storage. For them, winter isn't just inconvenient, it's life-threatening. There's also the issue of rain. Tropical monkeys are used to steady rainfall spread throughout the year, keeping forests green and food production constant. Northern climates often have wet and dry seasons, or unpredictable rainfall patterns, which can leave long stretches without their preferred foods. Temperature swings pose another challenge. In many parts of North America, even areas that get warm in summer can drop to near freezing at night in the winter. For a primate with little insulation, that's a recipe for hypothermia. All of this means that as monkeys moved north, they would have found fewer and fewer areas that could support them year-round. The tropical forests they depended on became patchy, separated by open savannas, dry scrub, or cooler highlands. Every gap like that would have been another obstacle, shrinking their chances of making it all the way into the United States. Here's the plot twist. North America actually did have primates once. Not monkeys as we know them today, but their ancient relatives. If we rewind to about 55 million years ago, during the Eocene Epoch, the continent was almost unrecognizable. Much of what's now the United States and Canada was covered in dense subtropical forests. Temperatures were warmer, winters were mild to non-existent, and the plant life looked more like something out of Central America. And living in those forests were small, lemur-like primates such as Teilhardina. These early primates weren't swinging through the canopy in big troops or cracking nuts with tools. They were tiny, lightweight, and probably nocturnal, feeding on fruit, leaves, and insects. Think more along the lines of a modern bush baby than a capuchin. Fossils of Talhydena have been found in places like Wyoming, which today is better known for bison and snow, not tropical forests. For millions of years, these primates thrived in North America. But then the climate began to cool, forests thinned, seasons became more extreme, and winters brought temperatures too cold for primates to survive. By the end of the Eocene, these early relatives had vanished from the continent entirely. This extinction left a primate-shaped gap in North America's ecosystems, one that was never filled again by their descendants. By the time monkeys evolved and diversified far to the south, the northern landscapes had already shifted towards cooler, more seasonal environments that were hostile to most primates. While North America doesn't have native monkeys anymore, there are a few odd places where you can find them today, and they got there with a little help from us. Florida is the most famous example. In the 1930s, a tourboat operator released a small group of rhesus macaques into an island in the Silver River to spice up his jungle-themed boat rides. Those macaques not only survived, but spread along the riverbanks, and now there are hundreds of them living in the wild. They've adapted surprisingly well, eating everything from local plants to human food, and even swimming, something most people don't picture monkeys doing. South Florida has another strange case, a population of vervet monkeys near an airport. These ones likely escaped from a research facility decades ago, and have been quietly living in mangroves and suburbs ever since. They keep to themselves, for the most part, but sightings still surprise locals who don't expect to see a troop of African monkeys hanging out in Florida. Puerto Rico, while not part of the continental US, also has its own colonies of rhesus macaques and patus monkeys, both introduced for research in the mid-20th century. With the island's tropical climate, they've done well, although they sometimes run into conflict with farmers. The key thing with all of these populations is that they survive only in warm, frost-free environments. They haven't spread far beyond their starting points, because the moment they hit a colder or drier region, their survival odds drop fast. They're not expanding into the rest of the continent, they're holding on to these small, favorable pockets. They're the exceptions that prove the rule. Monkeys can live in parts of North America today, but only where the climate gives them a fighting chance. Let's say someone released a group of Central American monkeys into the wild in North America today. Could they make it? 
In the warmest parts of the continent, like southern Florida, the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, or certain sheltered areas of coastal California, they might stand a chance. These places stay mild year-round, have plenty of vegetation, and already support other tropical escapees like iguanas and parrots. But life wouldn't be easy. Predators like hawks, eagles, bobcats, and coyotes would be new threats for species used to different predator lineups in Central America. Food could still be a challenge in the cooler months, especially during droughts or if fruiting trees have off-seasons. Over decades, the most adaptable species, probably capuchins, could establish stable populations in the warmest regions, but it's unlikely they'd spread far beyond those pockets. The same environmental limits that stopped them in the past would still be in play today. That's all for today. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. You can also leave a comment with what you would like to see in the following videos. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.